Hello and welcome to another tutorial. As you can see, we're going to be going back to a project finance topic today since we haven't covered this sector in a while. I'll be discussing the levelized cost of energy and also giving you a few Excel examples. Now, this is a metric that became famous almost entirely because of Lazard, the famous investment bank, which releases this levelized cost of energy report each year. And among other claims, they use it to attempt to show that renewables are now cost competitive with conventional energy sources. So we'll look at this, whether it's true, how to calculate it, and what it really means in this lesson. Now, if you want all the files and resources here, go to our project finance page and then slash levelized dash cost dash of dash energy. I'll link to this and pin it below the video so you can just click on it from there. This is another summary from our full project finance and infrastructure modeling course. So the basic idea with the levelized cost of energy is to take the present value of the life cycle costs of an asset, such as a solar plant or a wind farm or a nuclear power plant, and then divide that by the present value of the lifetime energy production from that asset. Now, these life cycle costs are always going to include operating expenses and the initial capex to construct it. And if it is something like a nuclear or gas or coal plant, then you will include fuel costs as well. So I have up here a solar example in a quarterly model and... If you go to the bottom where we have the levelized cost of energy calculations, we have the development and construction costs, we have the revenue, the EBITDA, and the expenses all the way down to cash flow available for debt service. And I've just summed up the total operating expenses and capital expenditures here at the bottom. So to calculate the present value of the operating expenses and capital expenditures in this case, we can use the XNBV function because this is a quarterly model. We'll go up and get the discount rate from right here. I'll use the nominal discount rate for now. And then we will enter the values over here so the total OPEX plus CAPEX. And then we will go all the way up to the top to get the dates because this is a quarterly model. So we need to enter the dates for this XNPV function to work. We have that. And then for the present value of the electricity generation, I'll use XNPV again. We'll get the 9% discount rate right here. And then we'll go up and get the electricity generation here. This is in kilowatt hours. So it's initially zero as the asset is being developed, but then it goes up to a very high level. It does fluctuate because it is a solar asset, which means of course that it is seasonal. It's going to be lower in the winter months and higher in the summer months. And then we'll get that from right there. Now we get an issue with the units here. I can just divide by a thousand or units, which is a named cell here. And we convert this into the proper megawatt hours metric. We'll take the present value of the expenses and divide by the present value of the electricity generation. We get to our nominalized levelized cost of energy of around 151 Australian dollars here. This is a solar plant in Australia. So these are all in Australian dollars. And that's the basic idea for how you calculate this. Now you could interpret this as the long-term marginal cost of electricity generation from this asset. You could also interpret it as the weighted average price that you need to sell electricity at for the IRR to equal the discount rate on this project. So if you want the overall IRR for all investors to be equal to this 9% nominal discount rate, then this is the price at which over the long term you need to sell electricity for that to actually happen. The discount rate here should be WAC, the weighted average cost of capital, because the electricity generation is used to pay all the investors. It's available to all the investors in the project, both the equity and the debt investors. Now, the discount rate in this calculation is normally based on the targeted IRR for the equity investors and then the interest rate on the debt funding and then their respective percentages. So if the equity investors are targeting a 12% return here, we use that for the cost of equity. If the interest rate on the debt is 10%, then that's what we use for cost of debt. And then the debt and equity percentages are just based on the funding for the initial project. So if it's 60% debt funding and 40% equity, that's what we use right here to calculate this. With the expenses, there is some debate, but we tend to use a more expansive definition and include not just the operating and maintenance costs and insurance and leases and things like that, but also the reserves, the change of working capital, the decommissioning, cash outflow, and even the maintenance capex during the holding period. In real life, the levelized cost of energy is best used to compare similar assets, such as two solar plants in the same region or the same state, or two offshore wind farms in the same part of the ocean, for example. People often misinterpret and misuse the metric, and it doesn't always mean what you think it means or what banks like Lazard claim that it means in their presentations. So that's the short answer. Let's now go through this tutorial, and I'll walk through each of these in a little bit more detail, and also show you a few more examples in this segment. 
So first, we'll go through the solar development calculation in a little bit more detail. Then I'll explain what the levelized cost of energy actually means here. Then we'll go through an example for a nuclear power plant in South Korea and how the levelized cost of energy differs there. And then I'll address some of the controversies, uses, and misuses of this metric. So in the solar development calculation, I lay out some of the assumptions on screen for the discount rate, which we actually went through before. For the revenue, this is based on a feed-in tariff in Australia, which is sort of like a power purchase agreement. There are also some incentive payments here for certain production levels. The expenses are mostly based on the plant's capacity, which is 130 megawatts. Some are also fixed expenses that escalate with inflation. And then some other items here, such as the reserve contributions and withdrawals, tend to trend with the fluctuating cash flows each quarter. You also have things like the maintenance capex that will depend on upcoming maintenance needs, like replacing the inverters on the solar panels, for example. So if we go back to the Excel file, I'm not going to go through all the math for the cash flow line items here because it gets more complicated and time consuming to show you. But for example, for the discount rate, the way we calculate it here is by taking the debt percentage, 60%. We would then multiply by the interest rate. I'll then multiply by one minus the tax rate of 30%. And then we can take the targeted equity IRR for the cost of equity and multiply by the percent of equity, 40% right here, and that gets us the 9%. For the revenue, for the contractual revenue that is already locked in by contracts here, we can go up and we'll start by taking the rate in this period, which escalates each year. So this will be higher each year, but on a quarterly basis, it doesn't necessarily change, which is why it's staying the same in these first four quarters. We can take this and then multiply by the electricity generated and then multiply by the operations flag. Flags are very common in project finance and you use them to figure out whether the asset is currently operating or whether it's still under development, for example. So we have that. And I'll just copy this across. And then for the operating and maintenance expense here, this is also quite similar. So with this one, we wanna go up and take our operating and maintenance expense for this year. Now this is an annual expense, which means we need to divide it by four to get it on a quarterly basis. It's also a dollar per kilowatt figure. So we need to multiply by the total project capacity, 130,000 kilowatts, the same as 130 megawatts. And then we'll divide by the number of quarters in the year four to convert this. And then once again, we wanna multiply by the operations period flag because we only want this expense once the asset is actually done being developed and is actually operating. So that just gives you a flavor of how to calculate some of these. Now, a few other things I wanna point out the development costs here are based on the developer estimates. There are no financing costs included here because we are looking at this on a capital structure neutral basis. So we're just considering what it costs to actually plan and develop the asset, but we're not including things like capitalized interest or loan fees or anything like that. For the present value of CapEx plus OpEx, as mentioned before, we wanna use the 9% discount rate. And then for the electricity generated, we could certainly use the 9% rate as I did in the first version, but some people will make the argument that you should adjust for inflation here and use the real discount rate. So if we say that the expected inflation rate is 3% based on the fact that expenses are assumed to rise by 3% per year, then the real discount rate would be 6%. And then when we go down here, we can discount the electricity generation based on the 6% rate instead. And go over to the electricity generated. And then let's go up and get our deets once again, because we're using the XNPV function. And we need to divide by a thousand to convert this to megawatt hours. And then we can take this or take the present value of our CapEx plus OpEx and divide by this. And so we get a different number like this. And some people will argue that this is the better approach. So what does the levelized cost of energy mean? To say anything here, we really need some data on other similar solar projects, ideally in Australia and ideally in the same region of Australia. If we look at the Lazard report and then another report I found here on Australian solar projects, and you just look at some of the numbers that they're quoting, our figures here are definitely on the high end of the range. They're not unreasonable, but if you look at where we're at around 150 or 120 Australian dollars, depending on the assumptions that you use and the discount rate, we're definitely on the higher end. If you look at the Lazard report and you look at what they quote for the utility scale solar, again, we're definitely 
on the higher end of the range here, but these are in US dollars. If you convert from Australian dollars to US dollars, it's not unreasonable for these ranges. Now, some people might look at this and say that the starting rate here, which is $133.41 per megawatt hour is too low because it's below the levelized cost of energy of $151 or $152 per megawatt hour. But it's not quite that simple because you have to look at the weighted average over the project's life and also calculate the IRR to check yourself. So for example, if we go up and let's just say that we go to the start of the project, let's figure out when it starts. So it seems to start here in March of 2026. If I go up and I take the FIT rate right here and we just do a simple average over a long time frame. This project lasts for about 20 years, so I'll go out that far. And let's just check ourselves. Okay, so it ends in March of 2046. If we take a long-term average like this, it's actually more like $192 per megawatt hour. So this might actually be enough to earn this 9% IRR, but to really check ourselves, as I say here, we'd have to calculate the IRR to check the math. But just because the initial rate is lower than the levelized cost of energy doesn't mean anything because that rate will change over time. Now, if you look at levelized cost of energy for a nuclear power plant, there are a few differences. First off, you have to factor in the fuel costs as well as the spent fuel costs to dispose of or store the used uranium. This actually doesn't make that much of a difference because with nuclear upfront capex accounts for most of the costs, you'd actually see more of a difference here if you were looking at a gas plant or a coal plant, for example. The discount rate also tends to be more complex because something as long lived as a nuclear plant often uses more complex financing. So here's a nuclear example where it's based on the same idea, development costs plus cash operating expenses. And if you look at the cash operating expenses, Yes, we have operating and maintenance costs, but we also have fuel and spent fuel costs here. So it's the same basic idea, but there are just more expense categories here. So that creates some differences as well as the long time frame. And then if you look at the discount rate used in this model, because of the fact that we have preferred stock as well, and then a dividend yield on that, and we have preferred stock, a construction loan, and investor equity in the capital structure, the discount rate calculation here is definitely a bit more complex than it was in the first example for the solar plant. So now let's talk about some of the controversies, uses, and misuses of this metric. So first off, the calculations themselves can be wildly inconsistent because some industries historically have not actually discounted the future electricity generation, which of course makes, makes the metric look much better than it actually is. Some people will count different types of expenses in it. Some people will argue that taxes should be included or that they shouldn't be included. Some people will argue about the change in working capital and reserves and other things like that. So there is a lot of disagreement about exactly how to calculate this. But I think the more major problem is that levelized cost of energy doesn't account for qualitative factors, such as the fact that renewables have intermittent generation. If the sun is shining or the wind is blowing, great, but if not, you're not gonna get any power from the asset. They also don't account for things like pollution, carbon emissions, transmission costs, the fact that you might need to construct more of a system around the asset to even use it. There's also uncertainty around fuel costs in terms of prices and supplies. So levelized cost of energy doesn't account for any of that. People also argue about the proper discount rate because for example, a lot of private investors will tend to use a higher discount rate, but a lot of government and public sources will tend to use a much lower discount rate because they're targeting lower returns. The bottom line is that the levelized cost of energy can be useful if you're comparing two very similar assets, such as two solar plants or two nuclear assets or two wind farms in the same region, but it's not as useful for comparing different types of assets. So what Lazard does here is interesting, but it's sort of useless because it's a bit like looking at high growth tech companies and then comparing them to manufacturing companies and saying, well, the high growth tech companies trade at higher multiples. Of course they do because the risk and return profile is different. And with these energy assets, the qualitative attributes are so different that I don't really think this is an appropriate comparison. The other issue is that investors don't necessarily make decisions based on the levelized cost of energy. They care about the returns, the revenue, the expenses, the cash flows, the IRRs, the multiples. So they tend to focus a lot more on that. And that's why this metric is not really that relevant, although it can be useful to look at when you're comparing very similar assets. You can find a lot of 
articles online about the flaws with this metric as well and some attempts to improve it by creating a value adjusted LCOE. So I'll link to these and you can certainly take a look at these, but I think a lot of other people have summed up online what the drawbacks of this metric are. We're at the end, so let's do a quick recap and summary. With the solar development, I walked through the calculation, showed you the discount rate, some of the revenue and expense drivers right there. The bottom line is that the, the particular asset that we're looking at seems quite expensive, but not unreasonably so. It's just that it seems to be at the upper end of the normal range for the levelized cost of energy for solar. In this context, all it really means is that if we're looking at a very similar asset in the same region, then maybe we'd prefer that one if it has a lower levelized cost of energy, but we can't really make a direct comparison between this and a wind farm or a geothermal plant or a nuclear plant, for example. If you're looking at conventional power plants such as nuclear or gas or coal, then you also have to include the fuel costs. Also, sometimes the financing sources can be a bit more complex for something as long lived as a nuclear plant with a development time that might take a decade or more. And then finally, the controversies, uses and misuses. The bottom line is that you wanna be very careful with this metric. You shouldn't use it to compare different types of assets. It should be used to compare very similar assets in the same region. The same way you use valuation multiples for comparable public companies, for example. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this metric, why it matters in project finance, how to use it, and then what to avoid with this metric as well.